Hey there, it's Walter here from fxjake.com and you're here at The Daily Trader. And today I'd like to talk about personality. Now, some people, <laughs> it always makes me laugh. Some people, when they talk about personality, you know, they're <laughs> in psychology, there's often a class that you can take, or actually several, as you go higher up in, in psychology. Mo most people know that I'm, I'm a psychologist by training. And um, one of the things I used to, we used to always laugh at is, when someone would come to a personality class and say, yeah, you know, people have told me I need to get a better personality, so they come they come and take the class. <laughs> they they're thinking if they go to the class, they'll learn to have a better personality. But that's not really, really what the study of personality is about. It's really about coming up with ways at looking at different individuals and seeing can we put them on a scale um, from one end to another. And there's basically one, you're going to hear a lot, if you get into this in psychology, you're going to hear about a lot of different schools of thought in terms of personality. Um, but there is one that's a little bit more dominant and well-known than the others. And that's the five-factor theory. And let me explain what each of those factors are and how it relates back to your trading, because that's what this is all about, right? So, okay, so the five factors are what people call ocean. That's O, C, E, A, and N. And those stand for each of the dimensions. And if you think of them in terms of a continuum, so you have one end where, where someone is very open to experience, for example, which is actually the first factor. And then you have on the other end of that same dimension, Someone who's more closed-minded and not as open to experience. So that's where the O comes from. That's the first one, which is openness. So that's the first one. Let's, let's go through each of these, and I'll talk about them as we go. So openness. And that just means, are you somebody who is um, tolerant of ambiguity? Which means, you know, if something's not quite clear, are you tolerant of that? Or do you have a capacity to absorb information? Um, are you very focused? And do you have the ability to be aware of more feelings, thoughts, and impulses simultaneously? So are you able to move through all those emotions at the same time? Um, you get intense experiences if you're very open. Open people are often motivated to seek out the unfamiliar and really look for the complexity around them. So on the other end of the openness, openness scale is what's called closed-mindedness. I'll just call it closed. But basically, that's the opposite of this, right? So they're not necessarily open to new experiences and um, tolerating things that are sort of uncategor uncategorized Whereas open people who are higher on the openness scale are more likely to accept those things. So that makes sense. Um, in your trading, let's think, what would that mean for you as a trader? If you were open, perhaps you're more open to different trading systems, right? And, then, and, you're, and whereas a, someone who's a little bit more on the closed-minded side of things might say, oh, you know, I'm... Uh, I'm sure that the only trading system that works is one that's uh, moving average based. So only moving averages can make you money. The banks, the bank traders use moving averages, so I'm going to use moving averages. Yeah, that might be you know, a kind of a closed-minded approach to trading systems, where someone who's open might say, you know what, I don't mind trading moving average systems. I don't mind trading naked systems. I don't mind trading MACD and stochastic systems or whatever, you know, they're sort of open to all different kinds of things, which, you know, can be good and can be bad. If you're very open, maybe you're always switching trading systems and maybe you're closed minded when it comes to trading systems. Perhaps you're more focused on only one and you don't even consider the other ones. That could be a good thing because you could get to that level of expertise, maybe a little bit faster than someone who's more open and testing different things. So, you know, it can't, it, I'm not saying that any of these categories are good or bad. I just want to point out how these things may change your thinking about your trading. Because if you know what you are, and I'll show you at the end of this video where you can go. Actually, below this video, there's a link. 
and you can click on that link and you can go to a, a place where you can take the ocean test and find out where you lie on the big five. So that's something to do. Okay, let's keep pushing through. Let's go to the next one. The next category here on ocean. So the first one is O, which is openness. C stands for conscientiousness. word didn't even fit on my screen. <laughs> we'll, make, we'll make it a little bit smaller here. Um, that still doesn't fit. Oh, almost. I don't know why it's important. Maybe I'm so conscientious it has to fit on the screen otherwise. There we go. So conscientiousness, what, what's that all about? Well, that's the second of the big five factors, and that's really impulse control. So it means if you're conscientious, then you um, are more able to direct yourself towards goals. So you are the one that has checklists. And if you're very conscientious, you say, okay, what do I have to do today? Well, I have a list of 17 things. I got to do these 17 things. You know, and you go through and you tick all those things. That's really um, a conscientious person, person who uses checklists. Someone who is more likely to think before acting. That's a conscientious person. Someone who's more likely to think and delay gratification and know that I don't want to go ahead and do this immediately. What I need to do is build up towards it. I need to follow the rules, follow the norms. I need to plan ahead. I like to organize things, prioritize my tasks, uh, look at my checklist, prioritize what needs to be done first, that sort of thing. Conscientious people are motivated to achieve things through social conformity. So they, they stick with the social norms and rules because they're conscientious people. Um, so people that aren't conscientious is very different, isn't it? Because these people are more likely to be impulsive um, and disregard the rules of society and norms. And these people are more likely to act sort of on the spur of the moment and less likely to plan ahead. So let's relate this back to uh, trading. Would a conscientious person or someone who's high on the conscientiousness scale and therefore low on impulsivity make for a good trader? Well, I can see a lot of reasons why we would say yes. One is obviously um, over trading is a big problem with a lot of traders and impulse impulsivity means that you know, you're jumping in trade after trade after trade. Whereas the conscientious trader maybe has to go through their checklist to make sure that this setup is a good one before he or she takes the trade. So that's one good thing to think about is, you know, a conscientious trader is probably going to filter out um, a lot of bad trades simply by being um, checklist oriented and, and thinking about it out loud and being very careful before jumping into a trade. The other thing is that um, the conscientious trader, if they're over conscientious, they, you know, they could be someone who's maybe not so interested in pulling the trigger, maybe scared, maybe worried about the uncertainty that a trade presents. So those sorts of things can be a bit tough for people who are, you know, very conscientious. Maybe um, they never get around to trading. They're always doing their testing and they never actually get into trading. So that's, a, that's one thing that, you know, could work against someone who's very conscientious. Let's move on to the next of the big five, which of course is the E, and that E stands for extroversion. Uh, many of you are probably very familiar with extroversion, introversion, and that's sort of those terms have sort of made extrovert, introvert, they've made their way into um, everyday vocabulary. So we're probably quite familiar with those topics, but the basic idea on the ocean scale is that someone who's high on extroversion and therefore low on introversion has an energetic approach to life and is very social and very energetic in their approach to social and material world. It means that um, they have a s strong interpersonal component and they're very enthusiastic, um, energetic with other people interested in other people and very friendly. They're highly motivated. Extroverts are highly motivated to seek social situations. They love to be in social situations. 
and love to be dominant or otherwise center of attention in those situations. These high extroversion people or, ext or called extroverts are motivated by change. They love variety in their lives. They love new challenges and they can get easily bored. So now, of course, on the other side of that is someone who's introverted, who doesn't seek social situations, who loves um, the sameness of things, doesn't really want to go out and get variety, but rather is motivated to keep things the same and not change. Maybe they're not as interested in challenges as someone who's more extroverted, and they're not bored. One of my favorite um, studies in psychology was looking at extroverted people and introverted people and they gave them caffeine to see what happened to them and they gave them a really boring task which was to go through a phone book and you know circle all the eights or something like that it was very boring and it took forever and what they found was interesting which was that those extroverts who had caffeine and then did the task were found to do much better than the introverts who had caffeine and took the, and did the task. The introverts did quite well if they didn't have caffeine, and the extroverts did much better if they did have caffeine. So, in other words, introverts are sort of at their peak mental abilities when they're just sort of sitting in front of a computer or in an office by themselves, whereas an extrovert needs that extra oomph they need to be in a social environment. They need to have things going on around them. They need to be, well, on caffeine or something that's a stimulant uh, to get going and to really get into uh, a phase where their thinking is at its best. So what does that say about trading? Well, if you're an extrovert and you're a trader, you may need to seek out activities with other traders. It could be meeting other traders for lunch. It could be going to the trading forum like nakedforexnow.com. It could be just having trading, trading buddies on Skype. Um, it could be posting your trade journal so that other people can pick apart your trades and you know tell you what they think. All those things are, you know, those social type things are things that extroverts are gonna need. It also might mean that an extrovert in their office might need to have music or might need to have caffeine or might, might need to have something going on other than just the, the computer screen. Um, what about introverts? Well, introverts probably are going to do quite well just focusing on one thing and testing something. For example, uh, an introvert is probably going to be okay testing a system for several weeks on their own on a computer. Whereas the extrovert probably will find that extremely boring and will need to have some interaction and ask other people what they think about the system. So um, whereas an extrovert might take another person's word as true, an introvert might say, I'm going to test it for myself. So there's a, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses with all these, but I think that you can see here that an extrovert's approach to trading and verifying trading systems might be very different to an introvert's. All right, let's keep going. Let's move on to the next one, which is um, after our O, C, O, openness, C, conscientiousness, E, extroversion, our next one is A, and A stands for, put it right here. Whoops, I'll put it right here, actually. Agreeableness. agreeableness. How agreeable are you? Again, this is also something that's interpersonal. It deals with how you relate to others. Agreeable people tend toward conformity in groups. So they don't like to stand out in a group. They tend to be modest and they're not generally demanding of others. And they generally are sympathetic to others. These people are motivated toward helping others and toward pro-social pro behavior. So, they're probably likely to, to donate their time, um, although females are more likely to donate their time than males, but the basic idea is that they're, they're there to help others. They're not there to stick out and, you know, sort of want praise, but they're modest, and they tend to belong to groups, so they identify with the group. Someone who is not agreeable, obviously, is probably going to be a little bit less likely to conform 
less likely to be modest, be more demanding of others, and probably not as sympathetic as someone who's higher on agreeableness. So these people obviously stick out more, essentially, and um, they, don't, they don't find belonging to the group very important. Whereas someone who's high on agreeableness wants to belong to a group. So again, as a trader, if you're high on agreeableness, what does that mean? It means you probably want to join a trading group, especially those that you think you know fit your mode of trading and, and, and belief in what you believe. So people who are high on agreeableness want to belong to a group and they want to help that group. They, they tend to be modest and they want to be helpful. Um, and they don't want to stick out necessarily. Now, if you're not high in agreeableness and you're a little bit low, then maybe you're not a person that's going to feel like you need to join a group, but instead you want to stand out and be different. People who are low on agreeableness are more likely to be demanding. Well, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It could be that you're a good leader. Maybe you'll teach other people to do things because you demand excellence from them, for example. So it doesn't mean that you're a bad person, it just means that you're different, And that, as with all these things. So it's important to keep that in mind when we're, when we're talking about these things. Let's talk about the last one now. So we had O, openness, C, conscientiousness, E is extroversion, A is agreeableness, and the last one is neuroticism. And this actually has a negative connotation, as you probably know, but it's not necessarily the case. So someone who's high on neuroticism, um, they have negative um, emotionality. So they're very anxious. They can be nervous, they can be sad and tense. This tends to be viewed negatively, right? A lot of people think of this as negative. However, keep in mind that you, you know neuroticism is only one of these five things in the in the ocean. So a person could be neurotic and conscientious, right? So this may have a negative effect on their health, for example, but may motivate them toward success in um, the workplace. So it's important to keep in mind here that just because you're high on neuroticism doesn't mean you're a bad person or a negative person. It just means that you're a little bit more likely to things to affect you. Now, if you're low on neuroticism, obviously you're much more stable emotionally and, you know, sort of like the idea of water off the, the duck, duck's back or whatever, that it just sort of flows right off you and things, you know, you just move on to the next thing if something bad happens. Whereas a neurotic, for someone who's high on neuroticism, more likely to affect them if something bad happens. So they experience emotions, and in particular negative emotions, and they feel anxious. And one interesting thing about neuroticism is that um, well, actually, anxiety, which is related to neuroticism in general, is that um, more intelligent people tend to be less anxious. So as you go up along the scale, now it's not a perfect correlation, but it is a correlation where people who tend to be more intelligent, they also tend to be less likely to be anxious. So that's something to think about. It doesn't mean that if you become less anxious, you'll be more intelligent. It just means that, in general, people who are, have a high IQ tend to be less anxious in general. So what does this say about trading? If we're, if we're looking at neuroticism and you know having this tense energy, feeling anxious, nervous, maybe sad, what does that have to say about our trading? Well, it probably means if we're high in neuroticism, we should probably work on this in terms of our trading. It's okay if we feel anxious about being in a trade. It may mean that we can't trade huge chunks of money on each trade. Maybe instead of risking 2% per trade, we risk half a percent per trade, for example, instead of risking 2%. That may be what we have to do if we know that we're a little bit high on the neuroticism scale. Um, if we're low in neuroticism, maybe, maybe that's a good thing because we know that even though we've had seven losing trades in a row, we know we're going to come back up and the next trade that presents itself, we're going to take that trade just as we should, and we're going to stick to our system. So there are lots of good things about someone who's low on neuroticism. I hope that this ocean uh, big five personality quick primer helps, and you understand uh, about all of this about uh, personality in general. Um, and you can take the test that's below, it's linked up below 
this video and see where you lie on openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism and see how you might adopt a different approach to your trading knowing what you know about your personality. I wish you very happy trading and until the next video, we'll see you soon. Bye.